are a lot of that there's a lot of work to do in your garden, but rest assured you're here today to learn that a lot of work is lack of bad design. <laughs> so we have to design our lives <laughs> so that we do not work too hard. It has nothing to do with laziness. <laughs> in fact, it has everything to do with a lot of patience, learning, and um, and just just believing that if you do take your time to do something in the beginning with a lot of patience, then it works out in the end. It pays dividends. It pays dividends. So think of the banking account. Your garden is a banking is is a bank. And you put dividends in there every year, and they pay off. Same with, um, with, with with many other things in life. Did you manage to get time to, to attend? Yes. Okay. We have. I think we have a few more minutes here. So just introductions. We have people from Chase, thank you, from Blind Bay, from Enderby Vernon. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any anywhere else? Salmon Arm. Scotch Creek. Oh, that's the furthest, isn't it? That's beyond Chase. Yeah, it's probably about the same mileage, but different directions. Okay. And I'm tapping Sunny Gray and Sunny. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to start right off with recognition today. I have a lot of gratitude for Bucketfield Salmon Arm and for the founders of permaculture, David Holmgren and Bill Mollison, who are Australians, who founded the permaculture movement many moons ago, when everybody thought that this was a hippie. Um, this is just a bunch of hippies together on a farm. <laughs> they received a lot of uh, criticism. It was very controversial. It still is, unfortunately. However, it's growing. It's a very, very growing movement and there's one reason why and it's because it works and because people have done it and, and it works. Um, I have a lot of gratitude for this website. When you go on YouTube everywhere, you'll find a lot of um, information on permaculture. It's, it's, it's confusing. Focus on one. I'm not just pushing one here. I mean, there are so many and they're all good. But the one that really helped me the, the most in my journey with permaculture is this website, permacultureprinciples.com. And for the teachers here, there even are little songs that the children can sing while they work. And you too, and this helps you remember what you're learning. Buckerfields, as I mentioned, um, the Food Action Society, well, Food Action Society, if it wasn't for them, they, they literally walk the talk. They walk during coldest night of the year, and they also walk, if they say we're going to do, make action on food, that's what's ha happened. And when I moved here a year ago, a little, mo little more than a year ago now, I was looking for, I, I took my time to observe, shrank into the background and observed. And this little group stood out, so thank you to them. They formed the Permaculture Guild last two weeks ago at the uh, seed swap in Enderby. A, a group of people who are now meeting again April 30th on the St. Marie's Farm, community farm in Not on Notch Hill. So follow the website and if you want to be on the email list, of the Shoe Swap Permaculture Guild, please email, send your interest to those e emails right there, to Melanie at Projects and to Serena. Selena. So I, I just have a lot of gratitude and just wanted to throw in those recognitions there before we start. I've mentioned that I'm here today to quickly teach you permaculture. It's not a lot of talking. But I want you to think of your garden now, your area, your space. That's it right there. There's your little home. Zone zero. <laughs> zone one is um, your greenhouse. If you have lucky to have one, your raised beds, 
your kitchen gardens where you're going to go every day to get something for your for your kitchen further away you have zone two which is your market crops if you're uh, selling it at the market or if you're giving it to neighbors and your crops that you start every year moving further away to zone three you have orchards and perennial crops perennial those crops that hopefully survive the winter and in zone four you have the fast if you have animals that's where they graze the road is there the road is important your entrance to your farm make sure it's beautiful make sure it's a canopy maybe hopefully of trees and then your pollinator plantings can happen there you don't want your pollinator plantings too close to the house you're gonna have herbs and that will attract your bees and your pollinators but you will, when you have children it can be challenging sometimes so have your pollinator plantings in zone four because once they're there they'll come closer as well and then zone five is your natural area a protected riparian zone say a wetland or or a hedgerow of trees shelter belt we have your animals and trees find out the best soil analysis people um, you can ask your farmers i'm not sure about the local ones it's best to divert the, the runoff water um, and that's energy you're catching water the energy of water to store it for the roots in your garden and the way you do that is you do double duck beds i'm going to show you a photo of a double duck bed you do in-ground beds loaded with organic matter now there's a wonderful company at um on the island at import mcneil it's called sea soil and you can look at their website it's sold here at buckerfields too it's expensive but if you have a small garden that to me is the go-to if i don't have ready-made compost I take 50% sea soil and 50% of my own <coughs> soil that's there already. Mix it together and do that at the beginning of the season because you want your soil to be the best it can be. Um, <coughs> remember, you don't have to work everything into the soil. We build top down shredded brown paper, just any brown paper. No, you have to be careful with brown paper. You get one that's <coughs> It's sold and it doesn't have this glossy glossiness on it shred that ink free newspaper i'm happy to say that um <coughs> the observer seven arm observer has ink free, um, toxic ink free newspaper that should be toxic um because a lot of inks are, are toxic so if you put on cardboard be careful where that cardboard comes from if it has a lot of writing on it mm -hmm. where was it made mm -hmm. so choose choose cardboard as much as you can without much writing on it or try and find out if that ink is toxic or not because all that's going to leach your little worms love cardboard and they're going to eat that and it might be harmful to them um, make three feet walkways why three feet why not what's wrong with a narrow walkway why at least three feet what fits in what are you going to use a wheelbarrow mm -hmm. make sure your wheel there is nothing worse than <laughs> going like this and trying not to step in your <coughs> garden if you have to have um to, to, to move your wheel wheelbarrow and then um place wood chips Strike up a conversation and a relationship with your local arborist. They're always in the area. And they sometimes don't want to drive too far to drop, drop off their wood chips. So ask them if they don't want to drop their wood chips at your or on your sidewalk. Any wood chips, ask where they've chipped it. If it's too much cedar, it's going to make your soils acidic. So if it's been sprayed, you don't want. So ask for no, no cedar if possible, spray free and thinner, not, not the thick stuff because that's going to that's gonna take a long time to break down. So that's how you get the energy from wood chips. That you're going to put in your walkways. Do we put wood chips in our, in our veggie beds? No, because
forest. It contains bark. Now the bark of a tree is the tree's natural way of protecting itself. So it has some toxins in it as well. It takes a long time to break down. You don't want it where you're gonna plant your lettuces. <coughs> Put it in the walkways because your walkways get full of weeds. <coughs> and then that prevents topsoil runoff as well. And then we all know about bark mulch. So be very careful with bark mulch. Walkways only. Because same reason comes from bark. It has toxins, it's very strong, it takes a long time to break down. The third principle is to obtain a yield. You're in this business to grow as much food as you can. And you're going to get overwhelmed by it because it's going to happen. You'll be overwhelmed by how much food you can grow. <laughs> really. <laughs> Do not fear. It's the way of nature. Nature's nature is to be abundant. So you plan large amounts of food yourself. Give it to others. It changes our neighborhoods if we put a basket of food in front of somebody. Use heat producing resources on site and the existing microclimate. So your little garden is going to have its own microclimate. You're going to walk there in the mornings and you just see mist around and just a wonderful ecosystem. So you're going to have wood chips. Uh, so what, what do you find on site? Wood chips, no cedar, manure. Be careful with manure. Why do I have to be careful with manure? Yeah. Weeds and also the source of that. Yeah. Fruit. Yeah. And manure, if it hasn't broken down properly, kills people. It's E. coli. It contains E. coli. So it's going to break down for six months or longer. People have died in California and Germany from putting fresh manure where they planted lettuces. So be very careful. Make sure it's when you use it, ask the farmer where did they, what did this animal eat? Horse manure? When did it last, when it last was it vaccinated? <laughs> Dewormed. You don't want manure that's going to kill your little wormies in your, in your soil because it has deworming medicine in it. So find out about the medication and then wait at least three weeks if there was such a, a, an addition. Best thing to do with manure if somebody gives it to you, it's wonderful stuff. Put it in a corner, wait six months till it breaks down if you're not sure. Yeah, so uh, uh, just be careful. And then you also have a rodent free composting system. We all want compost, but we want it to be rodent free. Mm -hmm. So no food scraps, no cheeses, no water. Um, there are wonderful compost, rodent free compost systems, these big. Um, uh, systems that have lids that no raccoon can break into or erode it. And you can also put the wire mesh underneath because they come in big on the side. Mm. So just make sure it's rodent free. Um, so yeah, we want a, a, a source of organics. Nelson has recently been the first municipality to provide residential pre-treated organics program um, so it's in the makings and when it's implemented residents will be equipped with an in-home appliance that will mash and dehydrate food waste that transformed the food waste into an odorless and dry soil amendment wow. that can be used to enhance your garden or collected by the city if you don't want it so they're doing that with a few volunteers in nelson mm -hmm. and i think that's fantastic because that's the way we're going to change things is with small steps that everybody else can copy. Mm -hmm. I've seen that in this farm where I was in Victoria. The municipality owned the land and actually no, CRD owned the land, capital regional district and there was a wetland. The next thing, there was an application to build condominiums there because it's in the middle of Cordova Bay in Victoria. And what happened? The neighbors started paying attention 
put on these suits, and they went to the municipality. Uh, during a municipal meeting, and I asked the mayor, who had a lot of vision at the time, bless his soul, and we uh, asked him if he wouldn't rather have that farm, which was agricultural land reserve, keep it in the ALR, and have an incubator farm there, or a farm that teaches farms, linked to the university, linked to Kamalson College and stuff. The mayor looked at this, and we all were blown away, he agreed. <laughs> he bought the land from the CRD, municipality bought the land for $600,000 at the time, and then came to us and said, fine, we don't want to work, we don't want anything to work and we're not going to pay you. We would like you to just um, form a non-profit society and could you give us a monthly report and we'll give you a five-year lease. Who's we? We then have to be a society, form a society that runs the land, reports to the university, to the um, municipality. So that's how relevant and form happened. And, um, People looked at it for five years, and then for 10 years. Today, after its founding, it started in 2002. You could look at the website. Many farmers, young farmers have moved on there. And then people have paid attention because the challenge was, where do they go after that? You know, this has been a wonderful, because they get a four year lease with a memorandum of understanding and so forth. Um, so then farmers retiring would then sell a part of their land to these young farmers at a good price. And now we have two such cases in Victoria where this has happened. So this is a whole other presentation. <laughs> I, just to, I just wanted to let you know that this is how you can do small steps which people can see and copy in your garden too. Your neighbors are going to come and they say, oh, wow, how did you get that? <laughs> and so on. You have to be, you have to be prepared to self-regulate. Self-regulate is when we find out things aren't working too well. And then we mustn't be too proud to say, oh, I cannot change. You have to change and accept feedback. If somebody says, you know what, that seed wasn't the best seed that you planted, you try this one then. So self-regulation and accepting feedback is very healthy. Start with a walkabout of your garden every morning with your cup of coffee, your tea, your water. Assess, reassess, reflect. Be open to receiving feedback from yourself. No, no, wait, no, 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 you haven't. You shouldn't, no. no. <laughs> Take your notebook and, you, and make, you know, make notes because you're gonna use it next year. What worked? Having patience in a slow and wet spring. Remember last, <laughs> last year how wet and slow the spring was? So, you know, be patient and that really worked. It was May before we started. What did not work? Planted wonderful sunflowers, but they unfortunately shaded the tomatoes. So your sun audit, if the sun moves like this, do not plant sunflowers in front of tomatoes that want sun. So look at your sun audit. Trellis, I'm talking now from experience what I did at the farm, but then I, I pulled the sunflowers. Trellises, um, I decided to, to grow a lot of tomatoes, field tomatoes. Unfortunately, I put cages around them instead of solid wood stacks. What happened at the end of the season when I had to clear this field? Oh, <laughs> there were like wrestling cages, with the oh, yeah. wrestling with the cages. And I planted way too many tomatoes. Three <laughs> rows of tomatoes. <laughs> and it's, it's daunting. <laughs> can be daunting, you know, if you don't have a lot of help, so, so, remember, five tomato plants are ample, that's, that's a lot, and uh, find out the best strategy, use and value review, what's a renewable resource, a resource that you plant that can, you can use again, that's renewable, nothing leaves your site, remember that, vegetable and your flower of cuts that there are too many, they can be your outside fertilizer. Put them in the one compost bin, number one. Weed branches in, 
in Google bit. That's good for new growth. So this word, does anybody not know what a Google bit is? Google is the, the German word for hill, and it means a hill bed. So you simply take the, the branches that are not thicker than your, your pointer finger, and you put that on the ground. You don't toss it out. You just put it on in a, in a <coughs> nice, neat area, and branches and all the weeds, weeds with seeds, yeah, you put that at the bottom, because your Google bed takes a while to break down. And if your seeds are at the bottom, there's no way they're gonna grow. Um, a, a hookah bed can be my height, five foot six, and then it's gonna break down to a half its size. And it will, forms wonderful soil. So use that. Is that the one where it starts with um, logs and then your cuttings and, and leaves and you just build from the large amounts to Well, it's just a layering of, of composting material. Nothing leaves the site. Don't have to put it on a trailer and drive it all the way to the landfill. Nothing leaves the site. So put it down and it, that's all going to break down. At the end of last season, I actually would love to see what happened because I couldn't get into the teaching garden. It was full of snow. But I started six Google beds at the fall cleanup. And we were wondering um, what happened and how they broke down. So they're going to break down and go right down. And then on top, you could put your, your sea soil now in the, in the spring and your compost and your soil. And you plant into that. And your plants will go happily. Those roots will just love all the food you've given there to them at the bottom. So learn all you can about Google beds. Save your seeds wherever you can. Your seeds saved on your site, even if it's just one or two packets, they're strong. They capture this inherent character of the area. Seeds are smart. They have adopted to, adapted to the cold winters here on, 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 on the hill. And so they save where you can. Don't let them leave the site. Garlic stalks grown on site is a great source of spray-free straw. So what is straw? So straw is um, that stalk there of this is barley. So this barley we snap off and put in sacks and sell it to the beer makers. And the, the rest you keep, and that's your straw. So you can grow your own straw. Look how it turns beautiful yellow there. So have an area where you grow your own straw. Then you also know it's, it's clean because organic straw is not, not just almost unattainable, it's very expensive. But I know Boga Fields gets it from a good spray free source, so that's your next step. Spray free. Um, so that is so what you use. Oh, can you see how we're going? We just use things on site. And then you also have grass trimmings. You, there's an area where you cut the grass. If there's no seed in your grass, that's one of the most valuable um, greens that you can, can get to provide mulch. You can use it in your beds, nitrogen, weed barrier. It feeds your soil, it keeps moisture, it protects, protects your soil from the cold nights. So use seedless grass trimming. Don't get rid of it. And also when you do store them, make sure you don't store them thicker than this because why not? They become dense and they start smelling like you won't believe and and all slimy and yeah. so work them into your compost so that they can mix and your compost is aerated you want aeration um, so don't make your grass too thick perennial plants and trees are renewable along with their yields so plant perennials things you can use year after year like strawberries and elderberries raspberries, border trees, um, and then also your wood chips, as I mentioned, they provide fungi avenues and soil food in the walkway and the border edges. So once more the, those wood chips, but only in your walkways. Principle six is don't waste, use and reuse. So this plastic, 
rolling along, um, still just putting the straw from back fields on top. There were weeds, a little bit of weeds, but luckily this plastic stopped the weed growth a lot. And then I rolled this up in the end and formed a beautiful little bird bath that the animals came and splashed around in. So we used the plastic. It was too heavy to drag away in the wood. And then um, the moving boxes that we used when we moved, we used that, put that in, in the walkways, ink-free, toxic ink-free cardboard, mulch on top of weeds, don't pull weeds, kill them with cardboard <laughs> and kindness. <laughs> Repair your older tools. If you have old tools, you can use you, some, always somebody who wants to repair it for you. Don't toss them away, unless they're rusted. That's a tricky one. Then you could maybe give it to an artist. Weeds and branches make up Google beds. Don't toss the weeds in the branches. Um, you have a seedless, weedless garden. Um, and then, you know, with compost and offcuts, you have a new compost. Use clean egg boxes. You can use that as well as, as a weed barrier. Food grade paper containers, these, you know, the new paper containers. They can be plant start holders, coffee cups. They can start, you, you poke holes in the bottom, they can be your plant starts, you don't always have to buy that. Now you're gonna design. First you design from patterns to details. You have a, like the, the little spider that spins its web, you have a pattern. That's what you want, you want this web. How are you gonna get there? Detail one. First I'm gonna feed the soil, and then I'm going to plant this uh, cabbage seed that I bought from a local grower, that, and it, I know it's growing used to the area. And then I'm gonna fertilize it with sea soil and my compost. I'm going to plant a lot of soil, nitrogen feeders like this amaranth around it. So you design intentionally. You copy nature. Water, sun, wind, slopes, shade. You plant sun loving tomatoes in full sun, Google beds. You extend hedgerows. So hedgerows, I cannot emphasize hedgerows enough. Now the water um, watersheds are so important, especially here in the Emerson Swamp because of algae growth in the lakes, we do not want dirty water going into the lakes. What do we do? We plant hedgerows. Plant hedgerows. What is a hedgerow? It's a row at the edge of your area from indigenous plants. Go to ask your, your local nursery, what is an indigenous food and pollinator plant, please? One that's been growing here for thousands of years, such as elderberries mock orange. Yeah, elderberries get big, but you crop them. I mean, you, you prune them, which is your next class, and you can and you can use it in your hugo bed. So don't forget hedgerows. They attract, attract the pollinators. They, they clean the soil, stop erosion, and we must remember that where we're standing are lots of aquifers, underground waterways, all going into the lake. So we must plant things that cleans that water before it reaches the lake. So if we all do that, just imagine how powerful that would be. I like permaculture for the reason that it also spills over into social systems. We can use these things in our lives. We do not segregate, we integrate. We grew plants, trees, animals, and insects. So these guys showed up as soon as I started the garden. <laughs> Ooh, uh, I better find out what she eat. I don't want to plant anything there that's going to kill me. Because, you know, we, this is, these are wonderful neighbors who've given this piece of land to the society. And you want to keep that relationship. You don't want to stir it the pot there with anything. So we found out what the sheep love. And man, do they love sunflower leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so the sunflower leaves went on that, that, that fence there. Sunflowers. Um, so it's a collaboration, and that ensures the health and the productivity of all. And that's what this Permaculture Guild is all about. It's about people getting together. The big ones help the small ones, and in between. And this is how 
It becomes sustainable and fun. If things are not fun, they're not going to last, so it's got to be fun. Um, we place the right plants, the right people, to breed together, interplant, plant, you don't just plant a row of cabbages. Plant, alyssum, companion plants, calendula, interplant, things in between that helps them. Pollinators, nobody's going to get food if the bees and the um, hummingbirds and the other pollinators don't come. So plant your flowers in between. And this is a fantastic resource, West Coast Seeds. I got it here. I'm not sure if they still have it, but you can also write to them, West Coast Seeds, and they send it you for free. It's a companion planting guide for plants you can plant with your crops. There are a few go-to ones like calendula, you can plant everywhere, cilantro, um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful resource. This is their gardening guide. This just says, gets better and better every year. So get this, it's free, and um, one seed at, at a time. I planted these sunflowers last year. They, they called Moulin Rouge. <laughs> they have this nice name too. <coughs> so we have guilds. So at the farm, I've seen how you can stack people's functions. I might know something about permaculture and nothing about pruning, but someone else does. So we help each other. We stack our functions. Our volunteers collaborate with each other. We have potlucks. That's the best food in town. You will never eat better than at a potluck of the young food that you've grown. And don't do it alone. Invite your little group of people. Stay in touch and help each other, especially after COVID. Relationships develop, not just for the land and the humans, but they can support each other. This one farmer um, now bought the land from, from this family that saw his worth while he was at Halibut. He's a thriving farmer today because those farmers trusted him and saw what he could do. He has a thriving blueberry business in the middle of Central Saanich. And um, just so happy that this, these things can happen. So relationships develop. We share community and insights on work bees. When you see the work bees advertised, please, please attend. We never work alone, we chat them. And it's a lot of, really a lot of fun and good exercise. It's because there's a common interest. We all like growing food. We want abundance, so we efficiently group different plants together and different people. The people who can work hard, those who love to plant trees, those who just want to work by themselves. And I am like that some days. I just want to be by myself in the garden. Other days I cannot talk enough. So it's just stack time and space, variety. Um, so guilds have seven functions. They provide staples, just for, not, not only for people, but also for soil, <coughs> climbers, supporters, miners and diggers, ground covers, and protectors. So these are the seven, in a nutshell, permaculture guild functions. And look at society. You have those folks who always give food. You have those who like the winning soil. Some climb. They want to climb and make decisions. The supporters, all our wonderful nonprofit societies, Miners and diggers, and ground covers, and oh yeah, the protectors. So, mm -hmm. um, in the garden, the protectors are repellents, like marigolds. Mm -hmm. If you want good carrots, plant marigolds around carrots, because they have such a strong scent that they drive away the carrot rust fly, that little white fly that smells the seed as soon as you put it in. <laughs> so put the marigolds in the same time as your, as your um, carrots, and that would protect your carrots. Shoe fly is a kind of a beautiful fruit plant that we, that we plant at the, at the opening of, of the greenhouse, because it invites in your, your good flies, 
and it shoots away the, the ones that eat your crops. Live fencing. Well, deer, everybody always says deer, but deer can jump high and far, but they cannot jump high and far at the same time. So what do you do? You plant double hedgerows. You plant another hedgerow here, another hedgerow three feet apart on the other side going that way. <coughs> that deer will stand there, they'll think, okay, I can jump at this one. I'm not sure what's going on in the next. So make a double hedgerow and make it at least seven feet high if you have a fence. They jump seven or eight feet too. They jump sideways. So, mm -hmm. You know, you have to live with them. It's, this is a um, double duck bed. This is something you do in the first year and it's good for, for four years. I did it for carrots because carrots love the soil to be like icing sugar mm -hmm. because then they go straight. Do you yeah. ever have a carrot that grows like that? <laughs> No, that's because it's struck a rock and a weed. And so you want your soil to be like uh, icing sugar. So you take, there's a whole system. You take soil from that side, bring it to your country nicely. You go down till you heat subsoil, so you get the different soil layers. So when you heat an orange, sort of, first you find out if you can dig. Mm -hmm. Don't dig where there's a gas flowing in the wind. So call, call before you dig. And then when you hit the subsoil, which is orange, then you put your compost and layers of old leaves, and then you take the next feet and you put that on top and then it looks like that. And you go on like that, it's great exercise. <laughs> but you know what? In the end of your season, you take those precision sprinkler. Isn't this wonderful? This is a great tool it's called a precision sprinkler. So you, whatever, a little stick and you put it down and remember so much, the soil will be soft, soft, soft. And this year, you're not going to do that hard work again because you did it last year. This year, you're just going to turn the soil and you see how soft it is. So try double dump beds. It's a small and a slow solution. So start small and you're going to do a garden. Start small. If you start small, you make small mistakes. <laughs> so in addition to your in-ground beds, you have raised beds, you have build up beds, you have the Google bed system. They can take time, but the dividends produce dividends. Remind yourself now not to be in too much of a hurry. If you turn the soil and it's too wet, you can actually damage it. It comes hard like concrete. So be careful. Don't be too much of a hurry. Um, use and value diversity. This is a picture of us. Um, some of us, anyways. Um, it creates healthier communities and healthier ecosystems. And age groups, from small to old, to seniors. And um, in the soil, we hear this word a lot now, biodiversity. Don't just plant one thing. Introduce as many flowers as you can, pollinators, provides healthier ecosystem and a definite harvest, even if one or more crops fail. So don't just plant a mono crop because if that fails, then what have you got? So plant a lot of things so that if one thing fails, you have another staple to go to. Diversity shows in people, from seniors to young people taking plant, a part in planting peas, for example, this time of year, they love it. Well, they love shedding the peas and you tell them about how it rests in a little duvet and sleeps nicely and they open it and, and it's so healthy for them. And then there's a lot of animals around that provides diversity. Visitors coming to your garden, that's diversity. And participating in a tour of your area. You can start an urban food garden tour. Find out who, who in town has the best garden. Organize a food garden to where a seminar people play. And then they come and visit the little gardens and see who, how other people do it. And then use edges. Remember the edges? They're very valuable. Marginal shelter belts and people. There are people at, at the edge of society today. They're valuable. You have to find out what their strengths are. So in a garden, edges. This is the neighbor's 
beautiful hay and this is where our garden starts so to prevent the hay we put on wood chips and elderberries and everybody said so the edges Sunflowers are phytoremedians. That's a very big word for they pull down toxins from underneath the soil. Mm -hmm. I know somebody in Victoria where there was a, a, an old um, co op station, a shell station, and they, you know how Tesco goes through there seven years um, and then they you can build there because of all the contaminants in the soil. Sunflowers, because sunflowers, they are phytometer, they heal the soil. So in that area of your garden where you know things were not so good, there was, it was an old workshop or something, that's sunflowers. And then when you take them out at the end of the season, don't use them on your compost, use them at the bottom of your Google bed. They attract pollinators as well, and you can use the seed. Not for eating, but um, just for next year's sunflowers. Which of your paths? Shady areas, you see the repetition? I hope you remember some of them. So shady areas for shade loving plants. Don't worry if you don't have sun. Kale loves shade and char too. In, and it gets so hot here. You can plant your lettuce there, your kale, your char. Use your fences, use everything. Bees can go up a fence, bees, squash. And then check with your neighbors. You know, so that they, you have edible edges for them that they want to snack on. Because they're going to snack on So they just go find out what they want. <laughs> and then be friendly bird bats. I only learned late into this game that bees can't swim. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. They can't swim. They, they land on the water and crash. Mm -hmm. And then their little wings get too wet and then they can't get off. So if you have a little rock in a bird bath for them, then they can stumble onto the rock and get dried. <laughs> And then cairns for salamanders, like little um, pyramids. Take rocks and build pyramids. Kids love that. And the North American garter snake, which is harmless. Yeah. They love that. And when you sleep at night, they come out and they eat those slugs. Mm -hmm. You know, they just bathe us. They love slugs. That's called integrated pest management. So don't spray. Please. Um, this one does. Um, and then if you find out what eats a lot of things, that's it, what you have to find out. Yeah, the flea beetle. That the, it makes beautiful holes in our crops at the beginning of the season. You think it's never going to survive. But snip those leaves. That mizuna or whatever you planted there, let this will come back. And a um, bee beetle has a lifespan. It dies in June. So then, then that plant's still alive if you keep on, keep on top of it. Um, use in, read up in integrated pest management. There's always something that eats something else. So uh, we had a big one, potato beet, mm -hmm. at the park, and um, at the teaching garden. And we found out that songbirds love potatoes. <coughs> so how do you attract songbirds? You find out what they love to eat and plant that. And they don't eat the berries. So people will say, oh yeah, but they can eat the berries. Not all bee birds eat the berries. If you plant enough bait crops for them on the edges, that's why hedgerows are there. They rarely go past to hedgerows. Mm -hmm. um, so respond to change. We go through change in our lives. Change, change is good. You believe me, you're scared of change, but use it creatively. Use it effectively. Um, so this is the permaculture flower. There's a whole lot more. Um, anything, I'm just gonna, what is the time please? We have 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So localization, use this word. People wanna change the world, start local. I like this word localization, that leads to globalization. And then all these, you can do it in land stewardship. The teaching garden is stewarding land. Building tools, technology, uh, education and culture. Um, 
We need more schools here, other than the school system. Water education is great, we, we need to support that. Uh, arts and music helps spiritual. Remember our body, mind and spirit, our indigenous culture revivals. Let's all support that. Um, let's look at finances and economics, how we can share cards, cars and farmer market, support farmer markets, food box programs, communities, you know what CSA is, it's where you buy a box from a farmer. Mm -hmm. Once a week, tradable energy quotas, DEQs, this is now an economical, and life cycles. You know, land tenure, Yarrow Eco Village near Chilliwack is a great example of land tenure. That's where people have land that they share, incubator farms, the one in Victoria, and cooperatives. In Bell River, there's a great co-op starting there. Okay, let's just quickly do, I also want to show you about soil building. Um, how to build your own soil. So you can grow your own mulches, cover crops and green manures. This isn't a very long one. Never crop rotation, never plant the same thing in the same place. So that's why your notebooks are important. There where you planted brassicas last year, all your cauliflowers, your um, cabbages, your lettuce and your spinach. Now you're gonna plant legumes, beans, peas, onions. Oh, don't plant brassicas again in the same place because they're heavy feeders, they pull a lot out of the soil. So you want to build the soil now with, with nitrogen fixers like legumes. All of this, by the way, is, is in this, yeah, this folder with pictures. And then in year three, follow with the potatoes, the tomatoes, the um, peppers, the selenums, and then your root crops, your beet, and then year four. So crop rotation happens after four years, and then you start at the beginning again. I just have a question. If you're planting peas, like, because you get all your trellises set up, you know, mm. it's all ready, like, mm. should you move that every year? Or can you leave peas in the same spot? No? Yeah. So they, they, where you had peas, now you're gonna plant tomatoes and okay. potatoes, so yeah. Okay. Can, yeah. can yeah. companion planting mitigate some of the need for that? Like with the three sisters beds, corns, beans, and squash, that like regulates some of the nitrogen in the soil. Yeah. So yeah. does that help with needing to rotate things like that? Three, three sisters, corn, growing up the uh, sunflower, and what's the other one? Squash. 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 Yeah, so the squash uses the sunflower as a stock. Oh. Those are great, <coughs> that mitigates a lot of your soil. Yeah. So plant uses three sisters as much as you can, it's a wonderful example. Um, so these are yeah, just what they all are. Uh, lawns. We have to minimize lawns. <laughs> Turn them into a habitat for native plants and wildlife. This is a great example. We have to mimic naturally occurring landscapes like forests, wetlands, and we use the wetlands. And the meadows. Meadows. We should use meadows. Um, country. People say, oh, it's invasive. Comfrey is one of the best things in the whole world. It, it's got Alan Twan in it, it, it's knit bone. They use it in the war, if you bleed, you, you put this on it, and it uh, instantly um, elastoplast. There's so many good things for comfrey. I, that's a whole section as well. Cardboard, healthy cardboard. Douglas fir dust is one of the best things you can use for blueberries. Now blueberries will die if you give them compost. You have to be very careful with blueberries. They, they, they like acidic soil and Douglas fir dust, very fine fir dust at the bottom in a donut. Don't let it touch the, their stalks because that's going to make their stalks rot. That's, uh, it's, and look at the consistency of it. It has to be fine. Grass clippings, seedless grass clippings, never throw it away. This is a wonderful exercise. We have to exercise. That's how you get old, <laughs> healthy. <laughs> and this is a great way to, you know, and if you sharpen the blades really well and uh, your grass isn't too large, it's a great little tool, a hand tool. Um, hey, 
wonderful hay. Hay is like the gold mount. Seedless. Sorry, not hay. Straw is the gold. Hay comes second, but it's got to be seedless. You could like be the seed, so be careful. But I put hay on top of garden in case it has seeds. Because where the seeds land, that's where you're going to get weeds. Next year, grass. Shredded leaves. Love the leaves and leave the, read the leaves. And people have obsession with these blower things <laughs> that, that are so noisy and bad. So, um, Eindhoven in the Netherlands, they have an example where they have now made a Bible in their parks. They, they, they use it. And they use it directly together and they use it in their garden. And we could follow that. And in Victoria, in Saanich has a Saanich leaf program. They they gather the leaves in a bowl, put it in their big trucks, shred it, and dump it in the park. And then the community can come and get it for free. Mm -hmm. yes. Ooh, that's cool. It's the shredding. It's the shredding. Yeah. Thing, so that's yeah. So they what do you use to shred it? I don't have a shredding machine. <laughs> a lawnmower. Yeah. With a yeah. lawnmower. Um, use healthy newspaper um, because, as I mentioned, the ink can be so bad. In India, they found that, you know, we never used to eat fish and chips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so people were getting very sick. Mm -hmm. In India, until they had to make a, a law which was very bad for the health because it had chemi chemicals, contaminants, mm -hmm. microorganisms. Mm -hmm. So we did. Pine needles. Um, when you put them down, make sure they, once more again, they don't, know, don't let it touch the, the stem. They're very acidic, but you can use them if you want to stop that weed packer from hitting your poor tree every time, because the weed packer is going to take off the bark of your tree and that's going to introduce um, contaminants. So be careful with um, weed packers. So there's a tree line apply and always make a little donut around there. Straw, that's gold. Seedless. Wood chips, make sure it's fine. And what about common veg in the cool season? Dairy veg is difficult to eradicate. It gets very sticky. <coughs> common veg is great. This is a these are cover crops you can plant in the fall. Rye grass, if, unless you're a big farmer, I wouldn't <coughs> plant rye because it's high maintenance, it's very invasive, it has an extensive root, and it attracts the wireworm. They found out at this research center in Agassiz, there's the wireworm, rye attracts wireworm, mm -hmm. evidently. And wireworm takes seven years replacing oh, no. the soil. Mm -hmm. Crimson clover is, grows fast in the cool season. It reseeds, it's a beautiful color crop. Look. Mm -hmm. Um, winter wheat, I use winter wheat. You plant it in September at the end of fall cleanup right away and it comes up this high and then the snow covers it and now it's going to shoot up again. It's going to look like that and then like that and then you can use the stalks for your own straw. Winter wheat is my go-to fall cover crop. It's so wonderful and it's also a great cover crop to clean up the uh, water going into the aquifer. Austrian winter pea is a great uh, nitrogen fixer, and you just leave that. It dies over the winter, and you plant into it, plant into it. Last one is broad bean, fantastic food and nitrogen fixer. You have to stake it. You can plant that in September. It stays like that in the soil. Over the winter, it shoots up in the spring, and here it is. Save the seed from it. Eat it, dries in this lovely little bed all winter long. So grow your own mulches and remember with your children, you have a farm, your garden, name it. Ask your children what name do they want to give it. And that gives ownership. That gives ownership to your growing state. It, you can name it after your child's name or Ask them, they're wonderful with, with names. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Well, that's my presentation. Huh? <laughs> and if you have questions, then please email me. I, I'm i so happy to help out. I'm lonely, I'm scrambling. I look after kids in the week. <laughs> and weekends I go to the farm, and that's safe. And in winter I read, read this, choose the seeds, <coughs> and join the permaculture guild. We're getting together at Notch Hill. Used to be Sue Moore's farm. She is the wonderful mentor at the teaching garden at this organic farm in Notch Hill, who now belongs to the St. Marie family. And they're gonna host the first permaculture guild April, uh, April 30th. Okay. Let's see where it goes. I'd like to see it, I've never seen it. Nice meeting you. Thank you. You Thank look you. so familiar, you've been to one before, haven't you? You have. Questions? If you don't have any general questions or just personal questions, I'm happy to help. But please keep going. Yeah. Do you have a question? Oh, no. <laughs> I just have a question. Couple. I have walnut trees. Are the leaves okay? And then it always has so many little walnuts that fall. They're like, or no chestnuts. They're the chestnuts, horse chestnuts. Are the leaves poisonous on those? No. Um, I think I should know. I know walnut trees are allelopathic, which means things don't grow too well around yeah. them. No, I don't know if chestnuts have the same effect. It grows under my tree. It grows under. No, nothing grows underneath my yes. chest. That's right. Mm -hmm. But I use the leaves, and things still grow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. Yeah. So be careful. I feel that it's, it's called a helopathic. They keep a great to make yeah. sure they're on their own. Yeah. 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 I know. Except for themselves. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They yeah. grow themselves over there. And and also remember comfrey under um, under apple trees. Make a donut of gum tree under your apple tree yeah. because then you can rip it off and use it as a mulch and those those roots go down deep and they feed nitrogen right there. And it keeps the weeds away. And and it has beautiful flowers for the for the mm -hmm. gums. And use it in your compost. Your compost wants greens and browns, nitrogens and carbons. Gum tree is the best nitrogen fixer you can have. It gets me. <laughs> yeah. And you can't plant it from seed. So find out, does anybody have comfrey? I'm actually looking for some. Oh, okay. Do you? Can you bring me some <laughs> extra? <laughs> oh, yeah. For comfort? To the garden? Yeah. Could you propagate it from the roots? Okay. Of the, yeah. Yes. It yes. doesn't go from seed. When are they going to start it? The garden? Do you know? Um, no. These are the last sessions now. So she wants to go in April. Okay. Yeah. I don't bring some. Thank you. Oh, appreciate that. Thank you everyone for coming to the Sunday session and for Elle Marie for sharing all of her information with us. Um, as you probably already know, the classes are offered on the sliding scale, so we usually recommend between $5 and $15, and you can just feel free to just put whatever you'd like into the donation box. Um, and then make your own change as well. And all that money goes towards having more classes like this and, and also towards the community garden that Elmarie mentioned a few times. So yeah, thank you so much for coming. Thanks.